You're tuned in to Evolve, a series dedicated to the evolution of technology, society, and business. With Aaron Spinley, let's get into the show. All right, Mark, well, welcome to the show. Hey, mate. Again. Yes. Uh, now, our viewers and listeners won't know that we're having a take two here because I didn't turn the sound on, but... Um, now I've outed myself on that one. <laughs> uh, the, the next two minutes will be as compelling as they were in the first take. I'm sure. <laughs> we'll have another go. We got a free rehearsal. Let's look at it. Let's look at it that way. I want to go backstage, Mark. I sort of want to understand Mark Oliver a little bit before we jump into the subject of creativity in the enterprise, because I've known you for a little while now, and I know you know the early parts of our conversations are about your journey as a you know a, a, a young footballer trying to make it at Chelsea Football Club and others, um, to the CEO of a creative agency on the other side of the world. Take us on that journey. Yeah, sure. Look, I, I'm, I really enjoyed uh, uh, the influence of sport. I think the influence of sport on, on me in the way that I've shaped uh, whatever my career is and whatever people perceive me to be. Um, so I, I originally uh, built a lot of confidence and comfort around um, uh, creativity by, by going to a, a, a school that was described as the fame school in the, in the UK. It was only a couple, of, a couple of years old at the time, but a place called the Brits, so wow. the British Record Industry Trust School for Performing Arts. And uh, I'd always been thrust forward as the, as, the, as the individual who would sing in school plays and kind of... Uh, do um, do the stuff that other people didn't want to do, right? And so there's a level of comfort and confidence that comes from that. And, right. and so this particular school, I learned actually uh, the power uh, in the facilitation and the production um, of uh, w- whether it's performance or whether it's a creative environment, yeah. that you don't actually have to be the person who, sit, who stands in, in, in front of the camera or the, you know, the, the, perform- the performance area. Um, to get an enormous sense of uh, purpose from, from what you do. And mm. I look back on that, that experience, and I think that's really foundational in, uh, in, in um, the rewards that you get from not necessarily being the, the, the lead, right? Right. Um, and so during that, during that period, uh, I was also lucky enough to play, play uh, football, or if, should we describe soccer, right? Sure. So that, that everybody understands what I'm talking sure. about. <laughs> and, um, Diversity is what uh, we call it. Uh, yes, quite. Um, <laughs> I think it's really, uh, that's been really important for my uh, passion for team, whether it's executed well or not is, you know, up for other people to debate, but um, I was able to bubble up very quickly because of, um, because of a level of confidence around leadership, as opposed to being the best player on the pitch. I was, I, and it's a theme that runs through the way they operate now, which is when I walk into a room, I do not expect to be the smartest person in the room. Uh, but I do, uh, I do enjoy the facilitation of smart people and right. being able to uh, put the right conversations together. So yeah, I was at I was at Chelsea for a bunch of time, and then uh, at Crystal Palace for a bunch of time. Some uh, you know, there's a point where you, when you are an elite something, that you no longer have to think about the core aspects of that, like yep. fitness. When we were you know playing at a high level there. And you can think about technique, yeah, because your because your body can give you no more, and that was a that's a that's a, you know this is not the body of an athlete now I'm sure you'll <laughs> agree, but uh, it is a, a it's a wonderful feeling, and I do uh, I pine for that feeling of of, uh, of high performance. So you know high performers are inherently insecure, and and you know I'm no different, right? Like yep. You keep striving for the next step, yeah. And so that led to uh, production, that led to running and organising and project management, which is a world I never anticipated being. But I felt like I could be really creative as a project manager and a facilitator. So I always viewed those structured roles as a really exciting opportunity to prove people wrong or be, right. be slight, don't be ordinary. Yeah, I think yeah, is yeah, a, yeah. You know, I, I love the idea of uh, my repeated messaging to any teams that I'm involved in. Well, there are two. One is don't be ordinary. Because I just don't feel like that's a great use of time, <laughs> yeah. you know, limited time, uh, and also, you know, at some point somebody is going to want to is going to walk through the door and they're going to say, "We want to move the moon two inches to the right," and you want to be surrounded by people who are going to sit down and have a conversation about yeah. how you move the moon to the right, yeah. not you know, arms folded, <laughs> "Thou shalt not pass." This is ridiculous. Yeah, and I love those environments. Um, 
From there, I was, uh, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, start my own business. I had a patent for board gaming. <laughs> I had that wonderful experience of 18 months of earning not a cent, <laughs> but flying around the world trying to get this bloody thing up and running. I've been there. <laughs> and I, I, oh my God, it's foundational, yeah. right? A really exceptional experience where um, you, know, you realize what you can, how you can live life without, um, mm. without all of the stuff that necessitates life now, right? I worked in the gaming industry across Europe, so I was lucky enough to fly around for Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Mostly, about nine, uh, for nine countries, so there's a little intersection there. Okay. Um, so uh, gaming is, a, is also a great place to, to, to find creativity yeah, and yeah. grow. Yeah. Um, it's actually something I'm going to spend a bit of time deep diving is the whole gaming industry. Adding. And how it's changed. Oh, it's phenomenal. And the kinds of people who are now operating in that very, very creative environment. From there, I was lucky enough to join a Upstel owned by News Corp. Okay. where I joined the Olympic team. Um, so all the way through that experience was, this has never been done before. Right. Uh, and it's, a tech, it's technology and streaming joining an existing broadcasting service. which right. is, uh, And nobody stops the Olympics if you fail to meet the deadline. Uh, and then from there, I, I, I was excited by mobile. Again, looking at a blank wall, where does this go? We don't know where, it, where, uh, mm. where, where the technology will take mm. us. Um, and I thrive in those environments where uh, you walk into a room and everybody's kind of like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and so p some people step up with the pen and draw. Yeah. Other people watch the people with the pen and yeah. kind of just po poke, prod, and facilitate. And I think um, uh, as uh, effective leaders, um, we'll be able to change the way they operate in those environments to get the best out of people. Probably. And as you know, I've had the pleasure of being part of that environment um, with you, and the, it just conjures up all these memories of sitting <laughs> in that in that uh, boardroom in, in um, Fitzroy and, and uh, sorry, in Brunswick right. and, and Street and playing around with that stuff. And you, just, you should do a shout out to you know the the Mark Hilden brands of the world who could whiteboard until there was nothing left on the whiteboard. <laughs> um, Theo Diaz, um, one of the great creative minds, back in gaming or was for a, for a while. I'm not sure if he's there. Yeah. Guys like Michael Ratt and. Indeed. Dean uh, yeah. Jenkins. We had a great cohort and, and many others. I should probably not have named names because I'll miss people. Oh, now. you missed Harriet. Harriet, uh, Harriet was uh, you know, right. uh, obviously a, a one, wonderful um, addition to the team. Uh, and so now, right, so I, I moved from mobile. We were lucky enough uh, to uh, have a great experience at Tiger Spike. Tiger yep. Spike was sold uh, in, a, in a wonderful acquisition to a, a, an American business. Eight years there where I uh, ran uh, the Asia operation. Um, and uh, now I'm CEO of a similar business. So, so give us a thousand foot view. Give us the plug, if you will. Tell us about it not. So we design, develop, uh, and um, uh, deliver great digital products, right? Um, uh, we, uh, some of the stuff that you would have looked at today um, on your phone uh, or, or on your, um, uh, uh, on your um, laptop will be products that uh, we have designed and um, kind of helped to facilitate and consulted and then delivered and now support. Okay. Uh, and we've done that with organizations like uh, AHM has been a fabulous partner of ours, okay. uh, Swiss, and uh, we are currently working with uh, Nando's, right? So these are big okay. programs of work where, where our organization now is taking leadership on digital programs of work. As a services business, we care most about how we engage with the client because as we're, um, as we're seeing digital departments emerge from within larger organizations, investment going into smart people who, who know they want that piece of data for that front end on that device to service that metric, um, not giving them the kind of experience that keeps them there and keeps them engaged and right. gets them where they want to be. Is, is not acceptable anymore. So this is interesting to me because, I mean, the way that you framed that then almost speaks to a little bit more, I don't know if maturity is the right word, but certainly now or knowledge inside businesses that, that want to service that data and that kind of user experience for that kind of metric, as you point out, wasn't that long ago where <coughs> that leadership resided in the external organisation, right? And so when I think about organizations, if we turn to the subject here around sort of creativity and the enterprise, I think there's sort of three paradigms or three dynamics that we see. One is kind of the holy grail, right, where 
an, an organisation can be successful in creating an environment where creative culture thrives across its business. Mm. Super hard to do, mm. yeah? And so by default then, most fall into one of two camps. They either outsource creativity, right? And we're seeing a little bit more of that blend as you sort of gave illustration to there, or they've come full circle and, you know, it's like in corporate, big corporate will... <coughs> there's option A and model A and model B and every three years we'll change between the two, right? And so we've seen this move where a lot of have tried to say, we're going to build a, an internal creative agency, mm-hmm. but we're going, to, we're going to do that internally now. So those are the sorts of three. What are you seeing now? What's the dominant thing that you're seeing or is it a mix? And have I missed one? What, what would your narrative be there? So uh, I, I identified early in my relationship with digital um, that uh, the, that tends to change on cycles, yep. and it and and the cycles tend to be around three year hits. Yeah, and the three years is linked to a number of factors. The first one is whether they got what they wanted, whether an organisation got what it wanted from its initial investment in a change cycle. Uh, particularly if we talk, if we na- if we narrow that down to a digital or c- or creative environments, right? You know, the, why we care about the client experience is because if you get that right, the only thing that can happen is that the customer experience benefits from that. Gotcha. So you, you you can only end up in the right spot, right? Uh, which is a per- which is I think uh, uh, an error that our industry makes. Right? The focus is we tends to be we will this thing we will make for you will be the uh, the absolute best it can be for your customers, and we will compete with you to get you there. And actually, uh, I think the maturing of the industry is that we're going to get, uh, we are, we're going to realise that actually we have to grow businesses into being able to see the value of that themselves. I have heard many, many super smart leaders of organisations, big corporations, say that we're going to be building our own agency model. And my question is, what does agency mean to you? Right. Uh, and right. there is no answer yeah. because it means so many different things. And I think what they're trying to do is to uh, is to be uh, they're trying to do a number of things. First is to be attractive to talent because when you start talking about a more flexible working environment, a more creative working environment, agency tends to be a tagline that that, that people can bind to because there's an immediate culture, there's an immediate uh, picture that emerges from that kind of environment. Right. Um, it tends to be linked to the movement of key personnel. So if, uh, if an organisation hires a particular leader for a function, they would be hooked to a particular operating style. Right. And the three-year cycle then uh, begins of there is a review of an external partnership model, outsourcing. The challenge of IP ownership is also fascinating. Um, if you invest in an outsourcing operation or, uh, or, or uh, external partnership model, what you find in larger organisations is they, they, the IP then resides into people who are not associated with the business. Gotcha. And the challenge for anybody who you know, services businesses who, who want to operate in that uh, environment is also keeping those people engaged with the working environment that we provide, right? Um, in, in a world where internal operations and um, internal agencies are escalating salaries to the point where it becomes very difficult. Right. Um, so you get a three-year cycle, a review period where everybody looks primarily, procure, procurement predominantly will look at the numbers and, and there is a, a method through which they, the, the, that they will want to see that sharpen. You get the second year, which is the migration and the hiring and the scaling up of an internal function, and some of them are enormous. These teams grow really quickly. Mm-hmm. How do you build a culture that grows really quickly? It's very dangerous, uh, very difficult, not dangerous, very difficult. Um, and then the third year of that cycle is the realization that they didn't quite get what they wanted from that investment. Right. And it's really hard to motivate and keep individuals or groups of individuals who come from a culture of agency which is like jumping into a washing machine yeah <clears throat> jumping into a washing machine where they have to wake up one morning and work in insurance and then solve a problem in retail and then go back to government work because the beauty of what we do in that services and agency world is the creative depth 
yeah. within uh, uh, yeah. of the problems that you get to solve. And, and look, the one of the things I found when I was operating more in, in your world a few years ago was that actually that cross pollination of ideas was really powerful, right? And you would find uh, what happens in industries is they get very institutionalized, and often they're solving the same problem in a completely different way. And if you can take that idea from point A or in industry A and put it over in industry D, there's the lights go on like you're a genius, but all you did was borrow an idea, right? Uh, but we don't see that. Industries tend to have these habits. They you know, go to their industry forums and their conferences and they repeat their ideas to each other and they, we live in this bubble sometimes, which is almost designed. Right? I, learned, I learned an enormous amount from just being a fly on the wall at UX Australia. Right. Large groups of creative people from individual businesses who outside of the forums of their operations are able to speak freely about some of the, uh, some of the challenges of, being of a, uh, having come from an agency background, that freewheeling, fast-paced, exciting model that we care about greatly, which is where uh, you know, um, it's that, uh, that culture of uh, insecurity because we're always driving for the next account or the next... Yep. You know, large large project that comes through from a from a, from a, an organisation, uh, and the challenges of, of moving people from that model into a sta- relatively stable, highly focused, uh, single product often uh, piece of thinking, where they have to go on deep domain expertise. Yeah. So that that depth of deep domain expertise, whether that's a UX UI, whether it's strategic thinking. Uh, or, or an engineering tech stack um, uh, is, is actually a constraint, mm. right? Because you spend 18 months looking at one feature and researching it and then developing it and then testing it where uh, the, 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 general, the general view of what agency does really well is to shake it up all the time. And give you a depth of uh, a depth of experience, yeah. And and that's really difficult for organisations to, uh, to 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 manage. The other part of that is that all of a sudden there's a pipeline to manage and people to keep busy. Yeah, yeah. And so there's a new that you have to provide a a really definitive purpose, and uh, that can be challenging ac- across uh, emerging cultures, especially if you're scaling quickly with creative people. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so when people talk about building an agency model, um, my questions are: uh, How are they going to? S- wh- what is it about agency that they're trying to replicate? Hmm. Can they do it realistically within their organisation? I'm, I'm not saying that it's not achievable. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult. Um, what types of personalities do they think are appropriate? Product people who work on a narrow product domain uh, are inherently they're wired differently to people who are happy to be context switching five yep. times in a day. Yep. Yet these context switches are high value because they broaden the creative landscape. They, the lens with which they view things is so much deeper. Mm. So they're higher value in organizations. So the pursuit of those individuals is, is really important for organizations to have a successful internal agency. But keeping them is a real challenge because there aren't that many yeah. <laughs> diverse problems. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and you know, in, in my not too distant history, I've been through this process of saying, okay, how do I create an, an agency-esque capability inside a big corporate, right? And you, you know through just history that that eventually died a death as well. And we, for, for some of the reasons you call out and some others which were more specific to that organisation, my provocations, digital people, creative people are starting to own decision making in organizations. Mm. It used to be marketing or IT, and then you'd mush them together and hopefully somewhere there would be a creative outcome, right? right. There'd be a product, there'd be a right. ma- a, a, an app or a website. Yeah. Digital people are now going, well, I don't want that. We don't need that. What we need is to solve that problem in this way. And what they're looking for are organizations to come in and solve the problem not to solve 10 problems with a thin veneer of uh, possible solutions. Okay. Let's talk a bit about, I guess, economics or viability of this. Because at the end of the day, you know, these cycles tend to have some of those flavours and the narrative around, you know, why we're doing this. Here's the scene. You build a fabulous relationship with like-minded creative people who are uh, empowered 
and um, excited at the opportunity to work in an agile kind of um, uh, in an agile framework or a scrum framework, right? Mm. Uh, who are happy with the ambiguity of not knowing how, where the end outcome is going to be, who are happy with the creative pro- process deviating and um, being challenged uh, along the course of the delivery. Then you get to the point where somebody's got to sign a document and somebody has to do the assessment on what the relationship and the outcome's going to be. And inherently what happens is it doesn't matter, mostly, what your relationship, your fabulous relationship with the team that executes. When a procurement individual or group gets hold of that account and says, well, how do I measure this? Mm. And I have no experience about how you guys have been operating on a daily basis. But what I can see from the 12 months ago when we last had this conversation is that, you spent, is that we spent this amount of money on you and therefore we must be valuable. And so we would like to see the rates change. Yep. And then all of a sudden, all of that work and that effort has to be translated back into an entirely different mindset. Yep. just to get you through the process of being able to work back yep. with the business again. Yep. And the time that and goes the, into that. The time and the energy and the risk and the risk for both parties. Yep. Because there's a, very clear, there's a very big risk that neither party gets what it wants from that exchange. There's so much that I could unpick in what you <laughs> just talked about there. I think one of the things, the flavours that's coming through, and, and I'm, we're going to hit on this further on as well, this, it's a cultural thing as well, and that's, this is where sometimes a procurement disconnect occurs per se because you're right, they're a critical function operating across business, right, across business. Everything from buying, you know, ballpoint pens to selecting the cleaners to the procurement contract on a creative agency. And therein lies the challenge, right? Exactly. And so how do you, you know, and you don't, I don't expect you to have an answer for this, but it's a, you know, it's to, if someone out there has an answer to this, please send us something. How do you translate that into a working culture that means that this context isn't lost? Because the context is that we always say the devil's in the detail. And when you operate at a level where you are split so broadly across all kinds of different functions and your metrics are hard and fast numbers, you miss context, you miss the devil in the detail, and so it, you have this cultural disconnect. The other bit I wonder about is, you know, when you live in a, and you mentioned it before, in an, in an agency world or in a service provider world, you're in this space where you are needing to balance the books like everyone else, right? You've got, you've got to manage pipeline, and you've, got to, hope. and you've got to manage margin, right? You're a business, and, and managing risk and reward. How does those dynamics translate when you shift from an external world to an internal world? For pipeline management and the uh, over here in services world, pipeline management and the context switching is, is inherent in the behavior of the way that you operate. Right. This person needs to jump on there for two days to get back to that so that we can level this. Pipeline looks as though we've got a, a client wants to bring in a piece of work by a month, another one wants to drop it by two months. Uh, you have... If you're really successful, you'll be able to see six months out. Uh, actually, if you're really successful, probably three months out, right? Right. Uh, because uh, contracts change all the time, right? This myth, you know, we, we talked about the myth of retainer. Well, actually, well, you know, that's very true because what you work on now is tends to be project cycles. It might be programs of work, but the way they're funded are very different. Um, and so one of the realizations of organizations that grow their internal operations is pipeline because you're gonna get all different parts of the business who suddenly want to uh, influence the way that you work or they want uh, internal projects to be explored um, or, they want, uh, or they're want, or they siphoning budget to be able to build a new feature set for a digital product that's driven out of another division. Yep. And all of a sudden, that becomes an internal pipeline of work that has to be managed. And organizations, particularly creative departments, new established departments, don't know how to do that. They don't know how to manage different jobs coming into different cycles with different budgets <coughs> and to justify some of the p and um, uh, choices that they make in order to establish this business. Right. So they've got to run their own, you've got to run an agency in- internally, not just uh, bring people into service functions. Right? Yeah, yeah. You've got to run a P&L. And running a P&L when you've got a variable pipeline 
and a whole bunch of decisions that kind of go get made and then dropped and then budgets get moved. Because when you're working internally as well as part of that pipeline management, there's nothing to stop the organization from changing its budget cycles right. or, or moving money around. Um, and instead of that being offloaded to, a, an, uh, to an agency or a partner who's able to go and acquire work for its team from other, you know, other parts of the industry, other sectors, and, and they're wired to look for that, you don't have that ethos within that internal uh, yeah. internal uh, internal division. Let's call it. Internal yeah. One of the things that's interesting about that is that then someone above all of that machination, right? So someone that's your PNL looks bad. Yeah, <laughs> they're talking to you, but then you're also then you're saying, well, yeah, but but you know, Janine over there cut a cut a project with us. So he goes, Janine, what's going on? So now Janine is beholden to come back to you, but now she doesn't like you very much, right? And so, again, it's just this internal cultural construct. When you outsource, you outsource the angst to some degree as well. Right? Quite. And, and uh, the, where uh, executives or management teams, leadership teams of organizations like Inlight and other comparable organizations, larger organizations, do really, really well uh, is managing that ambiguity. Right. And being able to hustle, to be able to keep people utilized. Right. When... Uh, we know that it's really difficult for organisations to be able to fix projects at a certain time. You just can't do that internally. Mm. And it becomes, de- it becomes demotivating when you're having to manage internal pipeline and be accountable for P&Ls when, in fact, you can't go out and kind of randomly grab that three-month three month project to fill a hole in the P&L that's been established by an internal kind of mechanism. So we're talking a little bit here about, you know, executing creative or digital product functions or however we want to describe that and whatever model we choose there. Let's go up a level a little bit. If, if you go into any conference, you know, an industry conference, uh, a professional conference, a company conference, the number one word you will hear will be innovation. And you can play bingo on these words, right? Innovation, disruption, transformation. It's it's part of, you know, for the last decade now, it's it's part of the the vocab it's it's everywhere it's it's not a conference unless you've got innovation now just having innovation's not there we have to have an unconference right? <laughs> <laughs> right yeah right so innovation's everywhere but we we still have a juxtaposition though because no matter where you sit on this innovation spectrum whether you're just being creative in the way you iterate your business or whether you're truly innovating in your paradigm or whether you're trying to change the entire paradigm the underpinning of that is this thing creativity. Yet, whilst we talk about innovation, everywhere we go, we haven't yet made creativity a comfortable home inside our businesses. To me, that is a juxtaposition. If you go back into the 80s, we didn't have conferences and talked about innovation, maybe maybe in a tech conference or something, Mm. perhaps. But that was about it. It wasn't everywhere across business. So you can kind of understand it then. It's harder to justify today, why do you think we still have that gap? Uh, so uh, I, um, innovation has been commoditized, right, at a corporate level. And, and so the language of innovation right. has, is, is kind of that, um, it's a product. Um, and I describe it as innovation Tourette's, right? <laughs> it's uncontrollable. <laughs> it's it, it, <laughs> and, uh, you know, as hard as you try, uh, there will be people in and around you who can't control themselves but to buzzword bingo or to, to try and influence using, the, um, uh, you know, using a passion for innovation. And you know that, that it's a wafer-thin capability. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that's linked to, that, to the rise and emergence and the, and the commoditization of innovation is it's just a whole lot of average people <laughs> who are executing <laughs> yeah. against it, right? It doesn't take more than three or four seconds to be able to call bullshit on somebody who's... <laughs> Yeah. Who, who's who's yeah. professing to be able to be either creative or innovative? Yeah, and I and I um, and I have that same. There there is that same immediacy when you talk to creative professionals. Yeah, and I get really excited by. Them. I love facial expression. I, I, I there's a wonderful lady that uh, I work with called Felicity, who coined the phrase "leaky face." And so I have a <laughs> leaky face, right? It was one of, one of my leadership challenges. Is, is, Shouldn't is a, play poker, right? No, that's, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. And, um, and I'm, when I'm around individuals who I find that are inherently creative, I can't help but 
kind of be um, affected by that. Yeah. Um, and and that that's not to say that uh, people with a more um, detail-oriented or more systematic way of thinking cannot execute creativity as well. Equally as exciting. Smart people doing smart things. Okay. Um, uh, if you spend any time, as, you, as you've spent a lot of time around this, this space, it's very hard to go anywhere without a Steve Jobs quote. So... So I'm going to give you a couple today. Let's do it. I'm going to start with uh, uh, a broad favourite of mine. And look, this is, you know, Apple's like this monolithic beast today. If, if it's not the world's most... Apple? I've never... Who are they? You know, they're a start-up somewhere. Gotcha. I love their campaign, Think Different. It goes like this. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, but the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the ones who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones that do. I love that quote. Also have a problem with it (laughs) because... It kind of puts all the creatives as misfits. And I think where we are today, they need to be great fits, perfect fits, not misfits. Um, And Steve Jobs quotes the course of his career, particularly his second coming at at Apple, um, get referenced a lot. So I want to throw a few at you. Hit me. All right, it's like a game show all of a sudden. Creativity is just connecting things. When you ask creative people how they did something, They feel a little guilty because they didn't really do it. They just saw something. It seemed obvious to them after a while. Thoughts? So what I'm interested in that quote is is actually uh, how it it changes if if it's actually other people who are seeing the creativity in individuals. Yeah, okay. So so the difference where I think... So where I think we've evolved on that statement is that uh, individuals themselves are just being creative and are not identifying as creative because you just wake up yeah. in the morning yeah. but actually other it's the skill and the influence of other people establishing that they are being creative through their the way that they operate mm. yeah I think the, the part that I like about it is the perspective piece that actually you're just seeing something because of who you are you, you we all see things differently sure. right and sometimes that's where the power is in itself. It's, you know, like we said, we didn't really think I was being creative. I didn't do anything. I just saw something. And yeah. I, I think that's something that when we, particularly in corporate organisations, when we, you know, there's that old saying, you don't get lemons growing on apple trees. You get like fruit, right? And so in a corporate organisation, you get people employing people that look like them and talk like them and walk like them. And it becomes this institutionalisation dynamic occurs and we end up with a la- lack of diversity, and everyone's talking about diversity at the moment, means that we've got a group of people that see the same thing from one perspective and miss things. And sometimes just by seeing something, it's, it's almost coined creative. It wasn't really, it was just we had this diversity of people right. that see things differently. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me give you number two. Hit me. So, and I love this one. Re- remembering that you are going to die is the best way... To I know, to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. I um so I'm drawn to so there's a really there's a real anchor there, right, about (laughs) death, right? Or this 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 uh, this ultimate uh, this ultimate end state. Um, I actually prefer to think of that as uh, where where uh, where I would place it is uh, other people have died. (laughs) <laughs> and not had the opportunity right. to express themselves in a creative way like I have now. You're an eternal optimist, aren't you? It sort of flows through <laughs> and tweak the perspective to go, I'm alive, damn it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, other people haven't got what I have in front of me. And, yeah, and yeah. therefore, that's more, that for me, that's more of a profound statement than, than identifying myself as having lost yeah. something. I've got a great uncle whenever you say, how are you, Teddy? He goes, well, I wouldn't be dead. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> Positivity. You touched the, on on the theme of this next quote before, so I think you relate to it. It says, quality is more important than quantity. One home run is much better than two doubles. I like the language of progress over perfection. Yeah. Um, And I think 
uh, for an o organizations that offer services into, or, uh, into businesses, mm. we have to be an accelerant. And sometimes, uh, and in fact, oftentimes, you have to uh, have this wonderful marriage of, of going somewhere uh, at the possible expen expense of being able to get the perfect outcome uh, yeah. at that time. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm deeply passionate about progress over perfection because the world that we live in will allow us, if it's a successful execution, to revisit it. Right. We do, um, we do it the right. That's quite, yeah, yeah. exactly. So I, de I do deviate slightly there. And I think that's probably, that, that's actually uh, another example of where the, the, the cultures of the, uh, of the sectors that we work in or the, or the, uh, the areas that we work in are very different. Yeah, well, cool. they're evolving, right? And, uh, absolutely. And the thing that resonates with me about that quote is that if you want to hit a home run, you've got to be prepared to swing and swing hard. And if, what that means is you've got to be prepared to miss. Right, and to me that speaks a little bit to where we found ourselves in the last little while around the adoption of agile. Mm. You know, this whole notion of failing, let alone failing fast, was like caused an allergic reaction in most businesses at the outset of that journey. Yeah. Right. So I think it's more important that you're comfortable just hitting a rubber, you know, with a rubber shot, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, because uh, you will move somewhere, um, and I don't think it's very often that you'll just swing and miss entirely. Right. Right, okay. All right, so what I'd like to discuss is who a creative is a little bit. And we live in, I was going to say it's a time, but it's not. We've always done this. We, we, we cheat a little bit mentally. We, we put people into buckets and we create categories and we, we do our mental filing, right? If you're listening to this on a podcast or if you're watching, um, close your eyes and just listen to this. So you have the classic writer with furrowed brow bent over a keyboard battling through his or her inner demons, the tortured soul trying to unlock the story within, right? We have the nutty art professor with paint all down his smock and unkept hair and remnants of a past meal still lodged in his windswept bed, right? And we have, perhaps more recently, uh, in recent years, the classic hipster designer, right, with a big manicured beard and a razor-cut fadeaway, and uh, cut off denim shorts rolling up to work on a skateboard. These are the kinds of stereotypical archetypes that we assign to these terms like creative. But you know what? You can get creativity in a manufacturing world. You can get it on the shop floor. You can uh, get it in the distribution center, mm. right? You can get it in auditors, believe it or not. You can, get, you, know, you can get it everywhere because one of the distinctive features of the human race is that humans create. Right, it's actually in us. It's part of us. It's not. It's not who you are. It's what you are. So, in terms of this stereo, these stereotypes that play out, mm. sometimes you could argue they're empowering, but also it has the effect of containing at times. How do you? How do you? If you were to describe the DNA of creativity, how would you describe that? Uh, I really like archetypes. Uh, and I like archetypes because they have a place in a broader narrative. So you, what, what you tend to find, uh, 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 there is power in being able to st structure narrative storytelling in particular ways. Hollywood does a, an right. impeccable job, right? right. And um, we did some work recently, and it's, it's a personal um, uh, habit of mine to see uh, the systematic and... Uh, repeating signals within operations, particularly in project delivery or, right. or in new thinking. And there is a definitive structure to it, and it maps specifically back to the way that Hollywood tells f uh, okay. film stories, right? Scripts, three acts. Right, um, beginning, and, middle, and an end. Yeah, and the, you know, the, uh, the character arc of, of uh, fi finding, um, of not knowing, then knowing, making a commitment, committing to the commitment, <laughs> and the en enemies and trials... Right. Um, and so I really like the way that archetypes enable you to be able, as a leader or somebody who tries to influence the direction of organisations or projects, um, that you're able to see a broader structure to it that, that you're, you can influence it in certain ways. Right. And I think uh, I, re I enjoy the foundation of archetypes uh, and stereotypes, if you want to call them that. Um, uh, I, uh, I think there is a place for that um, but 
uh, it has to be within uh, within a broader picture that somebody is able to establish. Yeah. Okay. Um, because then you then you can tweak and change, and you can influence in different ways. Um, but ultimately, these are heroes, right? Uh, I'm, I, I love the concept of the of the uh, of heroes within um, narrative storytelling. Um, and each hero needs a mentor, and each hero needs mm. a coach, and then a hero, in order to be a hero, needs to go through challenges. Mm. Um, and it's just a delightful way of reassuring people who are on an awkward journey, or who have, are trying to do something that they've never done before, that uh, that it has been done before, and if you want to have a structure, here is a way that it may play out, and your personal character arc will do this. Yeah, okay. Um, and what's... Uh, um, uh, what's interesting is how that maps back into or- organizational structure as well. Um, and so you've got to get the right people in the right seats, all, all, all that kind of, you know, all of the Jim Collins stuff, which I'm passionate about. Um, I, um, I'm really also passionate about um, uh, the, the quality of range within organizations. Okay. Uh, or individuals rather than organizations. And I think what we're talking to there is, um, is the people who are having an increasing influence on creativity within organizations or ev- evolving organizations are ranged individuals who are probably not the best uh, at, uh, they're not the best at one particular uh, narrow channel, but they are excellent at a whole range of different topics. And I think that's a David Epstein um, language from, from his book, Range, right? Okay. Um, so I think those individuals, are fast becoming the most valuable human assets for organizational change yeah, because they're able to facilitate and facilitate is the lost is the lost art of uh, of um, evolution within organizations how do you get this great big sucker working with yeah. all these disparate influences and stereotypes and archetypes well you've got to have people in there who have a range of capability to be credible in a whole bunch of different things, but not experts in a bunch of different mm. things. They are the individuals who um, uh, who help organisations move in a different direction. Now, it seemed to me as well to be the sorts of people that provide a little of buffer between perhaps, if I can call it, the tr- more traditional thinking in an organisation and the creative teams under that facilitator that so it sort of buffers or she buffers away from some of that noise and some of that pressure perhaps to allow creative to people to be creative. One of the things that strikes me is that organisations are quite largely still struggling to find creative talent in the way that, and maybe it's the way they're framing what they're looking for to some degree. But someone said to me a little while ago, it's hard to find creative people. And it got me thinking because, you know, when you're a kid growing up, we all played. We all had crazy out of control imaginations, right? We're all inherently creative. We made stuff, whether it was with sand or we were scribbling on walls, some of us, but we were all creative. There wasn't really a, you know, yeah, there were personalities, but we were all inherently full of imagination, right? And we kind of have creativity trained out of us to some degree in terms of the way we grow up in inverted commas, the way we come up into institutions and get told how to think and learn how to think in different ways. That sort of manifests itself further into business. And so people that are truly trying to be creative find themselves in an art class or a theatre or yeah, right. or go find an agency to try and see if there's something that they can do in there where they can sort of satisfy that creative need. Um, but less so do they find that home in business. How do we change that? Well, being creative is inherently hard. It's hard, bloody work. Right? Yep. And I, I, um, even the most inspirational talent will be sitting there scratching their head for days on end, trying to work out uh, and deviate and change and um, evolve their own thinking. So first and foremost, being creative is hard. Um, I don't think the challenge for organization is uh, cherry picking and then dropping in creative talent to try and um, uh, make something blossom from within their organization. Um, and this is a realization that's only come relatively recently, which is the power of, of facilitation and coaching. Right. So I believe, because it's hard work to be creative, um, and uh, you have to invest, and there's lots of disappointments, and you have to be resilient, you have to be willing, you have to be curious, 
you can facilitate individuals or groups to get closer to that way of thinking or those um, uh, those values. Mm. And so, as you're describing, there are very you know there's people who wouldn't necessarily be described as inherently creative, who could change the world tomorrow if you were just able to bring them to a position where they uh, where they're exploring the recesses of their knowledge, right? Mm. Um, and I think the uh, the next tier, so this thinking component that needs to outweigh the execution, has to be driven by the quality of facilitation. Because then you get 10 people within an organization who can be creative in certain ways and not an individual who's dropped in and charged with you know, a job description that says, um, through the sausage machine, we want four creative outcomes. Yeah, OK. Do you think it's, it's part of, you know, you hear a lot about psychological safety now in the workplace. And I know mental health is one of your great passions as well. Do you think it's about creating a safe environment for creatives to be creative? Uh, I think so. I think mental health is actually, uh, or the transparency of mental health, um, uh, which is only a positive thing for us to uh, change the stigma associated. And, yep. uh, but I think it is uh, it, it, it is one of the biggest challenges that you have for implementing creative programs, right, or creative thinking components to organizations um, because inherently in mental health challenges is a real um, uh, it, it is uh, a, a refocus right and you have um, uh, when individuals are having mental health challenges or we need to support as an organization once you hear you can't unhear and you have to do something right. or you have to respond or you have to support and of course you do we've implemented uh, mental health days, um, mentally health uh, well-being days uh, at Inlight now. Um, and all the way through my career, I've had a variety of different interactions that have been driven by mental health challenges, whether there are you know, personal triggers or work-related triggers, and some of them mm. we've dealt with exquisitely, and other ones have just been a terrible experience. Right. And a terrible experience for 10 people associated with the organisation, not just the individual who's having the challenges versus those isolated cases where you can work one-on-one -on -one and, and, and uh, apply all of the resources of the organization in a very quiet and dignified way. Yeah. Um, and so uh, some, of the, some of the distinct challenges that you'll have in organizational constructs around creativity is the uh, emerging transparency of mental health and the weight that it has on people who need to free their heads to be able to think, because yeah. it's the thinking component and the facilitation of the thinking component that gets you into places that you never thought you could be. Yeah. However, the weight of mental health challenge within enterprise is uh, could be so significant that it could, you know, it will take a large percentage of your energy and thinking space to be able to navigate complex interactions. The other part of that is that actually, for a lot of people who are going through um, some mental health challenges, PTSD or any you know depression or right. uh, you know stuff that goes on at home. Work is a, work is an environment that provides structure and safety. Yeah. And safety because the structure is there, because the no, people know the job, they can focus on things that are unrelated to where they may be challenged. Hmm. Um, and there's a support network of people who are focused on you know task activate you know task related hmm. activities. Hmm. So um, all of a sudden, if your creative layer is challenging and uh, moving the business in a direction where that stability is um, eradicated, you have an emergence within the workforce of the, some of the instability of in, you know, the challenges of in, individuals, the instability of some of, the, um, uh, uh, of some of the mindset of individuals that can you know, challenge the equilibrium of groups of people not just individuals, groups of operations. And I think um, we are nowhere near to resolving that. We're nowhere near to understanding the impact. Uh, I am nowhere near as a leader of understanding what, that, what, what I should be doing in environments where I need to provide support. Um, and you, 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 uh, you know, you, we tend to be finding our way along this. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, the quality or the... Um, uh, the execution of creativity within organizational change um, 
I think one of the biggest challenges that faces us is about the emerging transparency of mental health. Once you hear, once you're exposed to it, you can't unhear and it becomes something you need to deal with. Right. You've been a leader for a long time now. You're the CEO of a business. You continue to advise other businesses. You know, if there's a, a fellow CEO sitting in his car or listening to this podcast or tuning in through YouTube, um, what would be your message to them around the pillars for, well, creative culture, but safe culture, people culture, that enables these types of outcomes, creative and otherwise? Um, when people listen to you, they listen to every single word you say. Right. So you better be bloody careful what's coming out of your mouth at all times. And I am guilty uh, on uh, many occasions, through leaky face or other, uh, of spilling into misdirection or, or um, just um, uh, ero- eroding the value of leadership by, by um, choosing the wrong language at the wrong time. Um, the other thing that's made a real difference to my career is that um, is uh, a focus on giving people confidence. Confidence can drive businesses forward without actually, actually tangibly changing anything in the organisation. So one of my key uh, tenets as a, as a leader is to keep convincing people that they are better than they think they are. Right. You are better than you think you are. And invariably, that's always true, right? Because we're, we all suffer from imposter syndrome. We all you know, have our self-doubts and our anxieties and our human condition threatens to overtake us. Yep. A repeated messaging. Um, so I like the principles of repeated messaging. It really works. So uh, very, very specifically repeat the messaging that you find, think is important to the organisation. And one of those is, uh, uh, has to be, in any organisation that I work in, is you are better than you think you are. We are going to walk into and stretch ourselves. I have every faith that we will be there because we wouldn't be doing it unless we were um, confident we could reach that spot. Okay. Um, and the, some people respond to that by leapfrogging forward. Other people step forward. But either way, everybody as a team and as an organisation moves in one direction. Right. You know, it's an awesome time to be alive and in the field that both of us uh, get to play in at times. Privilege. Um, You know, I often talk about the rise of internet, the rise of mobile, the rise of social and and the societal shifts that have gone on associated to all of that. That all all really happened in the last decade. We've got a whole new decade in front of us now, a whole new set of things which will be the, the pillars that we talk about in a decade's time looking backwards. If we talk about enterprise creativity, and you you know you get your your uh, time machine out here, what do you think the future looks like? What's the next decade look like for enterprise creativity? One of the things when I was uh, when I had uh, my gaming patent that I realised by flying around and talking to the Hasbro's and Mattels of the world and other gaming industries was just like I've got to talk to people about it. I can't keep it in a cupboard, and th- because I fear that other people will run away with the concept. I have to get out there and share it. And so from that point onwards, I have been unashamedly um, uh, uh, precocious in the way that I kind of pour forth concepts and ideas. And I know that there are, there are occasions when people will kind of scratch their head and go, where did this guy come in from? Because this, <laughs> this does not make sense. But there is a percentage of that free-flowing conceptualization and thinking that actually has merit. Right. And I don't care about that stuff. You know, I don't care about whether people think it, it's madness or a, or a silly idea, because I want to get to that one. Right. And I'm really comfortable that I'm going to expose myself a little bit, because I'm really focused on that. Yep. And I think that reflects what industry is going to do as well, if yeah. it's not already. Okay. Now, this has been a lot of fun. The guys and girls that are coming on the show uh, highly experienced, really insightful, know this stuff inside out, and have got a really generous spirit. And I know anyone listening to this now will, will sense that about you as well. So I just want to give you the opportunity to throw your your pearls of wisdom on the table and see where they land. And I, and I don't mind if you want to give advice on career, on life, on anything at all, mental health, um, you know, personal aspects, how to be creative, how to be safe as a creative, whatever the gamut, you know, 
What would you le like to leave with people today? Uh, the value of resilience. Uh, it's not something. Uh, it's not something that's spoken about or identified very often. Uh, but when you talk to uh, le leaders of either large or small or really small businesses, you have to respect the resilience of their uh, uh, of um, uh, the resilience and their ability to get through challenges. Right. And that is no different to the creative experience. Uh, the resilience that you see in painters or designers or fashion um, mm. uh, fashion designers or all the way up to the end, you know, other end of the spectrum of ar architects, for instance. Um, there, it, it's hard, hard work, and you need to be resilient to be able to get through the bad times and the difficult times and unblock yourself uh, to see the. You know, I describe it as thirty days of of tough stuff in order to get to the one day of, the, right. of where you feel like you've nailed it. Right, yeah. Um, and that's whether you're a, uh, in a leadership forum or whether you're executing a creative thinking or designing, um, the value of resilience and just seeing it through and knowing that there's an end state, not being consumed by that single kind of individual entity or that moment uh, has been really powerful for me. Um, uh, and I, I, I get excited by thinking about resilience and identifying it in people. Mark, awesome advice. Um, I knew it would be. <laughs> I didn't want to say that to you before. Use as you see too, too, much, too much pressure on you. And, uh, <laughs> but no, absolutely wonderful advice. And I just want to thank you again for taking the time to do this because you know, when you start breaking out something like creativity in the enterprise, there's lots of you know, noise around that uh, to, to some degree, but it's largely the same same. And uh, I know you relate to that statement. Uh, and looking for, for perspectives that are based on experience and knowledge and are pragmatic and also delivered in a way that really cares about the human beings in the middle of that whole equation as well. So thank you so much for your time today and your insights. You've been listening to Evolve with Aaron Spinley. To ensure that you never miss an episode, please subscribe on YouTube or on your favourite podcast player. Thanks so much for hanging out. Until next time.